Today I'm going to, we've seen some uh, really interesting uh, presentations so far. Uh, some have been a little bit more micro, others a little bit more macro. Uh, and so I'm going to fo follow uh, Carl Mora's kind of macro model, uh, but I'm going to zero in on a couple, zoom in, I should say, on a couple of uh, cases. I'm presenting uh, a kind of a, a long-term large uh, collaborative research project and the, the title uh, of the, the project itself is El Cine Mexicano Se Impone. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and today I'm going to be focusing on foreigner, foreigners' gender, social hierarchies in Mexican golden age cinema. <coughs> and so uh, it's a project uh, about the, something that Carl alluded to, alluded to earlier, which is the uh, reception uh, of golden age Mexican cinema outside of Mexico. Uh, he mentioned that it was uh, exported all over Latin America, United States, Europe. It's something that kind of many, many film historians and critics mention, uh, have mentioned, but there had been very little uh, um, documentation of exactly what happened in all of these other, other markets. Uh, I should mention that uh, <coughs> a lot of this project was inspired by a couple of articles uh, by Ana Lopez, who's sitting here, um, who I think was thinking in that direction and started doing some of that work. And, and there were some kind of interesting pieces that we were able to build on in, in Cuba and a couple of other places. But, um, and it was a very kind of unwieldy project. I couldn't do it myself. We had to do archival research in many different countries, uh, in different languages. Uh, it's incomplete in a lot of ways, but uh, what we have come up with, I think, gives a kind of a, a firm ground for talking about uh, Mexican cinema and the golden age outside of Mexico. Mexican cinema uh, started being exported as early as the silent age. And so we see the cartel here for El Automóvil Gris, which was seen in uh, theaters in the United States, particularly Texas. Um, and so there were kind of roots of uh, Mexican cult, movement of Mexican culture and Mexicans that uh, made parts of the US kind of part of this, the circuit for Mexican film since the very beginning. Um, <coughs> And I'm, not, I'm going to kind of, as I said, be a little bit uh, macro and kind of go through quickly through some um, of these items. Uh, in the, in the, with the launch of sound film in the early 30s, um, there were some important things that happened right away. This is the um, cartel, the lobby card for, for Santa uh, with Lupita, Lupita Tovar. Uh, Carl mentioned that she's very old. She's 103, actually. Um, <coughs> And so one of the few big stars of, of the Mexican Golden Age that's still alive, but she's one of the earliest ones, which is kind of uh, unexpected. But Santa, so she had been acting in Hollywood already, as had several of the others who got involved in this very first uh, sound film project in Mexico. And so one of the ironies of uh, Santa when it was released was that apart from all of the publicity that it got as being this big sound film that was based on a best-selling novel that was well-known in Mexico. There had already been a silent film made of Santa. Um, so apart from all of that publicity and buzz that it created in Mexico, it created a significant buzz in Hollywood where Lupita, uh, the director, um, Antonio Moreno, uh, were <coughs> already well-known. They were working there. They were, they were colleagues of Hollywood stars. And so it's, it's gala opening in uh, the... I don't remember the name right now, but a, a big cinema, uh, a big um, Spanish language uh, film hall in downtown Los Angeles uh, generated a lot of buzz and people from Hollywood were there. So Laurel and Hardy, for example, attended this film, this Spanish language Mexican produced film uh, and all of this kind of commotion happening just right there in the shadow of Hollywood from the very beginning of Mexican sound film. Um, in those early years, and Carl alluded to this, the, the most production of, uh, of sound film in the Spanish language was being carried out in uh, the United States. And, and these figures, I don't know how meaningful they are. They, they talk about the number of films produced. So it's not the number of viewers or how much film or how much films grossed or anything like that, but it kind of gives you an idea of where the centers of film production were as at a time when 
they were just kind of starting to take shape. Uh, so the U.S. was producing the most at the, be the beginning. Uh, they didn't do it very well. They didn't do it in a way that was uh, authentic enough, acceptable enough for Latin American audiences, and they gradually reduced production just as the technology was arriving to other countries. And you can see that uh, Mexico, uh, Spain, and Argentina were the, the three main um, places where film was being produced. And prior to 1936, you can see all three of them are kind of gaining with Spain kind of in the lead. <coughs> and all that would change, of course, with Ayana Rancho Grande, the film that Carl mentioned earlier, um, uh, ranchera musical, musical comedy, melodrama, that just was a phenomenal, phenomenal success all over uh, the world and in a way that no one expected uh, a Mexican film to be able to achieve. Um, I don't have, I, I decided to do a talk presentation so I didn't bring um, little pieces of data, but you can find them in our publications, which I'll show you later. Um, but in, in, like in Colombia and Bogota, the film played for like a, a, almost a year running straight. Um, it was a phenomenal success in Spain in 1940. It took a while to get to Spain, but it was a huge success when it went to Spain. And it really proved that Latin American uh, sound film could be marketed in a big way uh, throughout the Americas. Um, and so you can kind of see I've, I've put in bold the second piece of this after 1935 and you can see how the production begins to change so Hollywood uh, in the USA column pretty much uh, falls off to nothing in the late 30s Spain which was leading in 1935 gets hit by civil war, which makes production almost impossible. And so you can see that it drops down to only four films in 1938. Uh, and, then try, and then begins to pick up after the war. Um, but Spain's relationship with Latin America is complicated by that time by its politics. Um, and uh, you'll see later that it never really captures the leader, leadership position again. Uh, meanwhile, Mexico is competing with Argentina. So right after uh, 1936, after with the success of Ayano Rancho Grande, which is in, in international markets is mostly 1937, um, you can see that Mexican film becomes uh, the, the leader uh, in 1937, 1938. Um, they began producing a lot of other ranchero films that were uh, successful for a while in other markets until they kind of became, became tired of that formula. And as you can see, Argentina begins gaining on Mexico in that period. And by the early 40s, Argentina has kind of a, a, a slight lead in terms of film production. Uh, there are regional differences as well. Mexico sells usually better kind of in the, the vicinity of uh, northern South America, Central America, the Caribbean, U.S., uh, whereas Argentina is more successful in the, in the southern cone, but not, but not exclusively. Uh, Argentina was, uh, according to uh, Cuban sources, the leader in Cuba for a while. So <clears throat> what happened uh, after that is Mexico begins, be began to kind of gain ground. Uh, they launched some new stars, Cantinflas maybe is the biggest one. Um, so Cantinflas has nothing to do with uh, Ranchera musicals. Um, and, and his films were among the most enduringly popular throughout the Golden Age everywhere. Uh, as repetitive as his comedy maybe got to be, uh, after a while, um, it was repetition that people uh, could not resist. They, they just saw him on the screen and would start smiling. And so his films were, were very, very successful, setting records in many markets well into the 1950s. Um, there were new genres that be became more and more popular. So melodrama had been there in the 1930s. This uh, ad is for Cuando los hijos se van. So this was a big, big hit in the early 1940s. And um, <clears throat> so this is a, another genre that Mexican film began to develop better and which sold very, very well in uh, foreign markets. And at, at this point, I'm talking mainly about Latin America and uh, the southwestern US. Um, but <clears throat> the kind of 
I think kind of some, some decisive changes happened around that time when Mexico began not just doing new things, but also thinking about how to sell their film product, which had sold really well for a little bit, uh, how to continue or, or to regain their market share uh, in the early 1940s in other Latin American markets. So Simón Bolívar was Mexico's first, I think, real kind of like film that was produced to be a blockbuster. Uh, and I, I don't have the uh, statistics to talk about what uh, other films cost. I, I didn't do a kind of comparative analysis, but this one was advertised as having cost a million pesos to produce. And there had been significant publicity in Colombia and Venezuela while they were producing, while they were doing pre-production, going to, to do research, but also to, to the, the director and producers meeting with the press. And so... <coughs> Uh, it generated a huge amount of buzz, uh, particularly in north, northern, and kind of north, uh, western, uh, South America, but also throughout the Americas. And so this is something new uh, for countries like Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador. Um, it was not just someone, uh, a, a film uh, studio system producing films in their language anymore, or even with kind of similar customs or something like that, or music that they could kind of like relate to, like, uh, as, like as they saw in, uh, you know, the tango films of Carlos Gardel or the ranchera films in Mexico. This was something that was theirs. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how that played out in some of those markets in a, in a couple of minutes. But the actor, the main, uh, the actor in the role of Simon Bolivar that you see in the photograph is, is Julian Soler, the Mexican actor and um, Mexican producers, Mexican writers, um, but a film about uh, Venezuela, Colombia. Uh, it's the era of, of Pan-Americanism and there were <coughs> political alliances with Mexico and the U.S. during the uh, during World War II that are well documented that um, although um, uh, <coughs> we, we spoke earlier about how it wasn't all U.S. helping uh, Latin America, but yes, there, there were some concrete alliances that went on and concrete influences where Mexico was being encouraged to produce um, films that had a kind of a Pan-Americanist um, uh, politics behind them. So La Liga de las Canciones, is you know, almost like what you would imagine Hollywood would produce uh, because there are uh, characters, I don't remember, there's an Argentine, there's a Mexican, uh, Mapi Cortez, so a Puerto Rican, I think there's a Cuban character in kind of stereotypical roles. There's a lot of music um, showing this kind of alliance in the context of the Americas. A film that's more interesting and amusing is El Indio Fernandez's second film, uh, Soy Puro Mexicano. Um, which is, if you look at the, most of the publicity from the film, it looks like a, 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 a charro film. It's Pedro Armendariz, uh, who is dressed as a charro, and there's like references to crime, and, um, and you can see there he is in his, his charro hat. But who is he with? You can see in the film, um, there is, um, Charles Romer is German. Um, I think that, I believe, Julian Soler, I think, is the one who is dressed as a, a Japanese guy. Um, to his left is an Italian. These are uh, Eje, uh, these are Axis spies who are hidden in the heartland of Mexico. And there's a convoluted plot that has to do with a reporter. Uh, ironically, uh, the actress to, on, the, on the far left is Austrian born, but she was playing an American. <laughs> Um, and anyway, so the Charro, Charro gets involved in this espionage, and it's all in the, and, and there's an American who's on the, the good side, and so there's this kind of um, hidden message of Pan Americanism that's kind of amusing, um, which doesn't get talked about actually much in the press anywhere. I mean, I, I, I looked to see if I could find anyone commenting on that aspect of the film in the, crit the criticism, uh, and I couldn't, couldn't find any of it anywhere. Uh, Doña Barbara is another really important moment. Um, so this is another uh, big blockbuster film that is very, very successful. Um, it's Maria Felix's star vehicle where she becomes La Doña. Um, 
But what's more important for its, uh, its success in, in foreign markets is that it's based on Romulo Gallegos' great uh, national novel of Venezuela. Gallegos had actually made some films in Venezuela. Um, in, as early as in, in the silent era, he was involved in film production uh, just prior to the production of this film. Uh, but he was not getting anywhere. There was not infrastructure. There was not um, uh, <coughs> really means of quality production in Venezuela. And, you know, of course, one option might have been to go to Hollywood, but he saw what was happening in Mexico and decided to go there instead. And so he got his dream produced, the great Venezuelan novel produced by, in, in Spanish, um, uh, but in the Mexican cinema. Uh, and with many Mexican actors like Maria Felix uh, in, the, in the lead roles. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about that dynamic in a, in a few minutes. Um, Canaima is another of his novels uh, that is, was almost kind of more problematically received as it was the second big uh, Gallegos novel um, that was produced in, in Mexico. The star was Jorge Negrete. Um, and if, if La Doña was, she was relatively new at the time, um, but Jorge Negrete was already well known as a charro. And so the, one of the um, crit criticisms of the film was that this was uh, Marcos Vargas is the character um, as a Mexican charro, or a, a Mexican charro as Marcos, Marcos, Marcos Vargas. Vargas. Manuel Zapata Olivella, who some of you may know from other contexts, um, he's a great uh, Colombian, uh, Afro-Colombian intellectual um, writer. Uh, but at the time of the production of Canaima, he was like working as a journalist and he was in Mexico. And so he decided to surreptitiously go to the set of Canaima and see what was happening. And so he went and pretended to be an extra and he like got in. <laughs> and, and in order to do that, he actually pretended that he was Venezuelan. And since all of the other extras were Mexican, he became an authority among the extras <laughs> on what was authentic. Uh, they were, they were um, what do you call them? The, you know, the, the, the rubber harvesters, calcheros. <laughs> uh, until it was discovered that there was another, Mexi uh, there was another Venezuelan in the film uh, who was in a, a more important role and he was sent to meet him and he was terrified of, of that happening, but it turned out that the other Venezuelan was from Caracas and really was not very knowledgeable about, about life in the, um, in the jungle anyway. Um, but anyway, he wrote about this and the kind of inauthenticity of what was happening in Mexican film in a, in a Colombian magazine later on. So the film, a phrase that we use a lot in our writing, but is one that we got mainly from the Mexican press, from Cinema Reporter and, and other Mexican press. A lot of it was coming out of the Mexican studios. The phrase, el cine mexicano se impone. Whenever there was a big hit, whenever there was kind of a big entry into a new market, this phrase was used. And it, 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 it evokes two things. It evokes triumph on the one hand, and there's a lot of real kind of positives about it. Uh, the conquest of new markets, prestige uh, of international prizes that Mexico began getting. Uh, Maria Candelaria won in Cannes. Uh, well, that, that would be a little bit later, 1946. Um, another thing that seemed really positive in Mexico as well as foreign markets was the way that Mexican film was competing with Hollywood and was gaining market share that no one imagined Spanish language film could, could attain in foreign markets. Um, and so this was something that was seen as positive, not just in the Mexican press, but also in, in other, other uh, countries' presses in Latin America, where they were like happy to see Mexico getting market share and not Hollywood taking everything, that it was one of ours who was competing. Um, <clears throat> there was the idea of shared values, which is something that uh, a lot of audiences identified with outside of Mexico, even if, even if they were, even if they, if there are no charros in uh, Ecuador, there were enough kind of cultural similarities that there was a, a, a kind of identification that uh, happened with, with uh, foreign audiences. Also, Mexico became a kind of a mecca of Spanish language cinema. And so uh, we saw, I, I mentioned uh, in my 
my question a little while ago, uh, this contest to bring a Colombian woman to act in Mexico. And the Colombians, uh, for example, were always excited uh, whenever Sofia Alvarez, who was their big star, uh, she starred in Ahí está el detalle with Cantinflas, uh, whenever she was in a Mex Mexican film, um, there were several other uh, actresses who didn't become as big, um, but uh, Colombian actresses, um, but who were covered constantly in the Colombian press. And so it was similar in, in other places. This is how our stars can make it big, is that they can go to Mexico. Um, and uh, I'm going to skip those. Uh, well, I'm gonna, I'll just comment on the, the second to last one that's in that list, Model for National Cinema. This is where it starts to get kind of problematic, and I'll just mention the Colombian case again, uh, where Mexico's success began to be seen in other parts of Latin America as not just something that's good because a country like us is doing well, but because, okay, so if, if Mexico can do it, maybe we can do it too if we follow Mexico's lead. Uh, and so they started producing films in Colombia, in the early 1940s um, with an eye toward Mexican success. So one of the earliest hits in Colombian cinema uh, in that era was call called Ayan el Trapiche, uh, so not Ayan el Rancho Grande. The, the plots were actually not that similar, but the, the title kind of shows where, what they were thinking. But this was problematic because um, Colombia couldn't be Mexico. So Colombia did not have a whole, whole range of trained uh, film stars. They had radio stars and they had stage stars. They didn't have uh, studios with modern equipment. They had notorious problems with sound in their films. Uh, and so the films were not that good, or at least audiences didn't see them as being that good. And so what, what, what the dynamic was, uh, was that there was a kind of a lack of identification maybe among a lot of audiences with Hollywood films. Uh, there could have been much, much more identification with Colombian films, but the identification that audiences felt with Mexican films was strong enough, and those films were uh, perceived in a more positive way. And also they had, the audiences had been kind of uh, accultured to get used to those kinds of films and that kind of production, and this is what they wanted. Uh, and so the Colombian films were never able to compete, and after 1945, they stopped producing, and there was not another film produced for five years in Colombia. So, yeah, here is Ayana Trapiche. So, um, <coughs> but I, I, I wanted to mention the last thing. So the, the other meaning of the, of the uh, phrase, imponerse, is actually that of imposition. And so some critics in Latin America, and undoubtedly some audiences, Began, began to feel uncomfortable. Began to be un feel uncomfortable that Doña Barbara had to have a Mexican accent, that Marcos Vargas had to be a charro, that Simón Bolívar was Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> and that when they tried to do it themselves, they couldn't. So um, going into the, into the 1940s, what happens, <coughs> and the early years of, of World War II are key, uh, not just because of the um, alliance with Hollywood that I mentioned, but because of the other thing that happened with Argentina, right? So, so Argentina didn't ally itself with the Allies. They remained neutral in World War II. Mexico, Mexico quickly allied itself with the U.S. <coughs> and so the, the, poli the cultural politics that were happening through Hollywood was, I think it's fairly well known, that Hollywood... Uh, the U.S. was able to cut Argentina off from the celluloid market. Um, so in addition to kind of helping Mexican cinema by, by investing in technology in Mexico, investing in um, the distribution of Mexican films, um, they, they really kind of hit, cut, a, cut a kind of a death blow to Argentina where they had to buy film on the black market and it was very expensive. Um, and so you can see that Argentine production, which was leading in the early 40s, uh, after 1942, is cut dramatically, at the same time when Mexican film begins to increase uh, dramatically. And so in 1945, we've got 82 films in Mexico, 22 in Argentina. Spain has 33, so Spain is like trying to, to uh, keep production 
going uh, and is doing so, but never really, really gains the, the big money that's, that's uh, coming to Mexico, which ends up producing over 100 films by the early 1950s, 100 films a year. <coughs> Very important moment is Maria Candelaria, when it, gain, when it wins uh, an award in Cannes, and this gives Mexico inroads into Europe uh, as well, which we'll talk about in, in a few minutes. Um, and uh, really kind of uh, a different kind of authenticity um, uh, and, and, and in that it's, it's able to produce uh, kind of art films, uh, films with kind of serious so socially conscious plots. Um, and even though they're very kind of national, nationalistic and formulaic uh, in a lot of ways, these are films that are seen as, as being much more high quality films than the ranchero comedies the, uh, or many of the other melodramas. Um, the the um, cinematography of Gabriel Figueroa is amazingly well respected uh, internationally and so these films are very well received. Um, Mexico begins co-producing. Uh, I wish I had time to talk about all of these things that were happening. The dynamic in Spain is really interesting when uh, Maria Félix and Jorge Negrete go there and the kinds of films that those two actors act in in Spain uh, and their relationships that they that those, their characters have with Spanish actors uh, are very interesting. Um, in uh, the, in, with Cuba, where Cuba, which uh, unlike Colombia, decides to uh, go with a strategy of trying to uh, orchestrate co-productions so that Cuba can, can be involved. However, um, the, the most well-known foreign icon of Mexican golden age cinema is La Rumbera. Uh, so it's a very sexualized uh, stereotype that, um, yeah, <coughs> Could, uh, there's a lot I could say about that, but I'm, I'm, I won't. I'm going to go uh, a little further. We see Arturo de Córdoba in La Balandra Isabel. Uh, Venezuela did try to, to do its own film production, and La Balandra Isabel was a film that was seen very, very positively. It won a cinematography prize in Cannes um, with... with <laughs> what Bolivar Films that produced it had a lot of trouble with was uh, what it represented. Um, so this is actually the cover photo for a book of ours, which I'll show you later on. Um, when we tried to get the rights, I thought we were going to be dealing with the Cinemateca Venezolana. Uh, and when we finally heard from them, they told us, well, actually, we don't have the rights to this film, uh, to this uh, image, which they had sent us. The rights belong to Bolivar Films. Bolivar Films still exists uh, 60, 70 years later. And when we asked them to use the photo on the cover, they, they initially told us that we couldn't because our book was about Mexican film. <laughs> Try to explain to them that our, our book is about its, its problematic reception in other markets. There's a whole chapter about Venezuela. And finally did convince them but in order to use the image, they made us promise in the credit to list this film as a film uh, courtesy of Bolivar Films, a 100% Venezuelan film. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to print that in 2014 when, when the book was printed. What's interesting is when I went back over my notes around the time of the production of this film in Venezuela, that same phrase, 100% Venezuelan film appears in most of the reviews and advertising for this film. So the problem is that the director is Argentine. The, the, ar the marquee star, Arturo de Córdoba, is Mexican. The cinematographer is Spanish. Uh, and so this idea of making a Venezuelan film, which couldn't be done with only Venezuelans, uh, was something that was uh, very uncomfortable. So, to, to just say a word about a couple of uh, cases. So, one case is that of Libertad La Marque, which Carl mentioned earlier. Huge star of early Argentine film, going back to the early 30s, um, was really, along with Carlos Gardel, the, the biggest Argentine star of, of the 1930s, and <coughs> continued to be a big star into the 1940s, as a singer, she was also very, very uh, popular uh, internationally. So was maybe was the most famous 
uh, Argentine of the moment uh, in the mid 1940s when she was filming that film, uh, La Cavalgata, Cavalgata del Circo, with uh, Eva Duarte in a minor role, and they supposedly had some kind of a clash. The, the legend, which like supposedly cannot be proven, but which is like really the way we want it to play out, is that La Marque gave her a slap across the face. <coughs> and after that film, uh, Eva Duarte, well, per Peron was elected, they got married, and Libertad La Marque was blacklisted and never worked in, in Argentina again for, I forget, 20, 30 uh, some years. So what did she do? She went to Mexico and became an even bigger star because Mexican cinema was bigger than Argentine cinema in the mid-40s. Uh, but kind of what, what's interesting is the roles that she played in Mexican cinema and what they might uh, imply for, um, uh, <coughs> for the film in that moment. I don't know how to turn on the, I have to go to this. Yeah, here's a clip. Do you, does anyone know where the sound is? song but with maybe a different voice um, <laughs> but anyway um, what we see in this film is emblematic of some of the roles that uh, Libertad La Marque started playing in Mexican film so <clears throat> she's she's always uh, she always sings in her films and so that is one of the big appeals of, of her star persona um, and so she's always a beloved star. There, she's, she's never seen in a negative way uh, <coughs> by her public. Um, she's never ridiculed. But if you look at some of the roles that she plays, uh, she's often playing the role of the mother. <coughs> and so um, the Mexican mother um, is kind of a sacred uh, role. But she's not a Mexican mother because everyone knows she's Libertad La Marque. So in many films, she's actually Argentine. Uh, and in, in this one, she's Argentine. In, in some films, she's Mexican, but um, never really gets the accent. And, and everyone knows anyway that she's Argentine. So she's never exactly the Mexican mother. And so if she's the Argentine mother, so she like assumes some of those characteristics of the Mexican mother, the, the long-suffering, uh, self-abnegating Mexican mother. Uh, and so that happens in films 
like Soledad, where she, um, I forget, if she, I think she has the child out of wedlock and ends up having to support it uh, in uh, working in, in the kind of Teatro Carpa. And uh, <coughs> the, the, the mother-in-law, so I guess she had the child with this rich guy. I, I don't remember the, the, the details. But anyway, she ends up giving up her child <coughs> to the wealthy family. And so making this major uh, <coughs> um, sacrifice for the good of the child. And so she's continually put into this kind of position where she's being stomped on as a mother, um, <coughs> much more than, than happens to like Sara Garcia. Uh, and so then she's cast as a, a, a crazy homeless woman or a, as a, a drunken woman in La, La Marquesa del Barrio. Um, and she's put into these positions where uh, the Argentine uh, character is not only female, and, and she, she is the most famous Argentine in Mexican cinema. Uh, Marga Lopez is a very famous Argentine in Mexican cinema, but a lot of Mexicans don't realize that she's Argentine because she does speak with a good Mexican accent. Um, <coughs> Marga Lopez is in this film, actually, as her daughter, Soledad. <coughs> and so there's, there's a kind of a twist on the suffering Mexican mother that is put on, on Libertad La Marque at the same time that Mexico is competing with and winning and kind of stomping on the Argentine film industry. Um, they do this in a very uh, kind of with a lot of finesse because she is never stomped on in terms of her public image, but it happens in the films. Um, and so this imposition starts to be felt more and more um, by the late 40s. Um, uh, the uh, press, for example, in some other countries begin complaining about this worldwide diffusion of Mexican culture that is giving Mexico this opportunity to present a positive image of itself all over the world. And everyone knows about Mexican mariachi music all over the world, but nobody has any idea about cumbia or about any kind of uh, music from Venezuela because those countries don't have that kind of access. Um, there's the habituation of audiences, where audiences are being trained to love Mexican films, and they cannot uh, be trained, they cannot be weaned off them to accept uh, national productions. There's the way that Mexico is controlling the presentation of their nations, and the, the most uh, uh, widely diffused images of several countries throughout the Americas is being controlled by Mexico, not by those countries. Um, the Mexicanization of national icons and the kinds of uh, roles that foreign stars are able to play in Mexican cinema begin to increasingly trouble uh, critics. Um, <clears throat> and so th these are some of the, the arguments that we, we present in this project and I'll, I'll conclude by just showing you the, the last case uh, which is another representation of the Mexican mother. Uh, the film is a forgotten film by El Indio Fernandez uh, called Un Día de Vida that has really kind of no resonance in Mexico. Um, it has not been produced commercially. Uh, I don't know if it was lost in Mexico. I didn't. Uh, Carlos Monsivais insisted to me that he had had it in uh, VHS form, but I never saw that. Um, I think he may have seen it on TV, and so probably it's in Televisa Studio somewhere, but I didn't, I didn't look for it. Um, what I found was this. has to work. <laughs> Quick time, not available. Okay, this is not my computer. I couldn't figure out how to fix, fix, hook up my Mac. Yeah, so I had, they, they didn't know how to hook up a Mac to this. So that's a shame. Um, is there um, Wi-Fi in this room? Is there Wi-Fi in this room? Because if somebody could connect to YouTube, I could just show this in a few minutes. And I'll, I'll just talk through it. Could, if somebody could come up to this computer and connect to Wi-Fi, like no side work. Um, anyway, this film uh, is called Un Día de Vida, 
Uh, it was not a big hit in Mexico. Uh, it was produced, I think, 1950, 51, so it was like right after the period when El Indio Fernandez was uh, making hit after hit and winning Ariel's every year. Um, and so it was like seen as a good quality film. Uh, it starred Colombo Dominguez, um, Roberto Cañedo, uh, Fernando Fernandez, and um, Revueltas. Uh, what's, what's her name? Rosaura Revueltas. Uh, oh yeah, there are the names. <laughs> and so it was kind of seen as a quality film, but it was not a big hit anywhere because I think everyone had seen this before. It was a melodrama set during the revolution. But in the early 50s, um, Mexico had made those inroads into Europe through um, the success of Maria Candelaria. And there was this moment when in Yugoslavia, um, there, was, there were political tensions between Tito and Stalin. And so um, no one was interested in watching Soviet film. So it was kind of like pulled out of the Yugoslav market. And they were kind of looking to fill that role and they didn't want to just bring in more stuff from Hollywood. And they discovered there was this other country that like had had a revolution, it has this kind of uh, <coughs> revolutionary film that's being made by this director. And so, um, so try putting Un Día de Vida. <coughs> and so Un Día de Vida went there and it was one of the first Indio Fernandez films that was seen in ex Yugoslavia. That's it, just click on that. And let's just watch this clip. So, just so you, you see what's happening there. So, um, so the interesting thing is that we found this film in the Cinemateca of Yugoslavia, what had been of Yugoslavia, which is now Serbia in, in Belgrade, where we discovered that this film is remembered as one of the all-time greatest uh, international films. Uh, it was um, relaunched again and again. The Yugoslavs continued buying rights to this film. It was a huge, huge hit when it was launched. Um, <clears throat> what was it? Maybe the melodrama, this kind of like revolutionary backdrop, um, the, the tragedy, the kind of heartbreaking tragedy that the Yugoslav newspapers reported everyone kind of leaving the theater in tears, sobbing. Um, this scene you can see is a very melodramatic scene. They're singing Las Mañanitas to the Rosaura Revueltas character, who is Mama Juanita in the film. And um, she doesn't know that her son is about to be executed for committing treason, for like having supported Zapata in the revolution. He has, he's going to be killed actually by his childhood best friend, uh, who's the one who's singing, Fernando Fernandez, who allowed him to go back to the, to the village for his, the celebration of his mother's Saints Day, which is why they're singing Las Mañanitas, <coughs> to like be able to see his mother one last time and not have her disappointed on her Saints Day. Uh, and uh, Colombia Dominguez is a reporter, uh, supposedly Cuban, uh, who is following this and has fallen in love with um, the Roberto Canedo character, and she knows what's going to happen. So there's all this tension. Uh, this was just like too much, not, not too much. It was just what Yugoslavians needed. <laughs> so, so not only did this film become a huge hit, but this song became, uh, it entered into the kind of national um, repertoire of Yugoslavia. However, it's not called Las Mañanitas. It's called either Mama Juanita 
or Jerandan Jivota, which is the translation of Undia de Vida into, Yugo, into uh, Serbo-Croatian, and is sung on Mother's Day, not for birthdays, because they associate this song with Mama Juanita. Um, and so, oh, my PowerPoint. So, um, <coughs> it not only was a big hit, but it gave rise to a whole huge trend in folk music in Yugoslavia that would last through the 60s and 70s that consisted of translations of Mexican songs. So, I, I know only two phrases in Serbo Croatian. One is Jedan Dan Jevota, Un Dia de Vida. The other one is Vedro Nebo, that's the translation of Cielito Lindo. Those are the two that I was able to remember. <coughs> but um, all of these uh, folk singers who normally sang uh, local folk music or Greek folk music started incorporating Mexican songs into their repertoire and sometimes even writing them. Um, and so um, Tito was also part of, part of this. It was really a major thing for uh, Yugoslavia and he celebrated uh, on several occasions with Mexican music. Um, <coughs> In as late uh, as recently as 1999, uh, Slavko Perovic, who was one of them who, who made this kind of one of the biggest stars of that era, did a kind of a revival of his Mexican songs. Um, so they're, they're still selling in Yugoslavia. They did a, a homage to Colombo Mingus in 1997. They invited her there. Um, and she's, she's a big Mexican star, but you know, when we think of the great stars of Mexican Golden Age film, we're thinking of Dolores del Rio, um, Cantinflas. Uh, Jorge Negrete. Columba Dominguez is kind of just, is a tier below that. She's not someone who you would think of getting an international uh, homage, but she was the one they invited because she was the star of this film. Um, <coughs> and so this uh, film of, the, I'm sorry, this other representation of the Mexican mother, uh, this time a real suffering Mexican mother, Mama Juanita, also made a big unexpected impact uh, outside of Mexico. Um, and so if you want to find out more about this, uh, I actually brought a few of these books. I, I'm happy to sell them. They're not that necessarily easy to get because it was published by La Unam, so the distribution is a little bit irregular. Um, but um, this book, they, uh, Unam asked us to, to produce a book for film aficionados. It's not an academic book. We were not allowed to use footnotes. Um, and so it kind of tells a story uh, about some key films. Um, and my co-author and co-kind of uh, co major collaborator on the project is Maricruz Castro Ricalde of the Tec de Monterrey de Toluca. Um, so this came out in 2011. Um, and then the English language book is this one, which has the Arturo de Córdoba uh, cover from La Balandra Isabel Llegó uh, Esta Tarde. Uh, again with Maria, Maria, Maria Cruz, but you can see that we had three uh, major collaborators. Uh, Dubravka Sujnovic, who did our research in Yugoslavia, Monica Surmuk uh, in uh, Argentina, and uh, Ima Alvarez in Spain. Um, and so this has really just come out with Palgrave uh, and the BFI, and so I don't have copies. Uh, but this is the one that, that uh, presents the kind of more academic story. So that's, that's what I wanted to present to you. Thank you very, very much to the organizers for, an, in, for the invitation and for all of you uh, for coming. It's been a pleasure.